imagination. It's got to have a practical side, a way of translating dream into reality. Imagination, practicality, the empire strikes back. This program is about all three. It's also about the latest in high technology movie making. It's about painstaking craftsmanship. It's about the teamwork required to place a dream on film. It's also about the fantasies that preceded and inspired The Empire Strikes Back. From the beginning of time, as 2001 reminded us, the creatures of Earth have aspired to the stars. But close encounters with other worlds, those are a product of our time. Now it seems everyone, audiences and filmmakers of all ages, wants to journey to galaxies far, far away, their passport is imagination. Their visa is special effects. offers us new galaxies to explore, old enemies to confront again. What is it, General? And new sources of enlightenment to consider. There's even a charming rogue to deal with as best we can. Attention, this is Lando Carissi. Naturally, all of our colleagues from Star Wars made the traveling squad again. There's C-3PO and R2-D2, of course. No, no, switch off. Joy. And Chewbacca, the Wookiee. Luke Skywalker keeps finding out that growing up is more difficult than he imagined. I don't know if Han Solo is ever going to grow up. Not enough for Princess Leia, anyway. Afraid I was going to leave without giving you a goodbye kiss? I just assumed he's a Wookiee. Lights come up in a movie theater. Actors like Harrison and Carrie and I can only hope we found some bit of magic and passed it on intact to the audience. Something that will make people go on caring about and remembering our adventures on the screen. But for the actors, magic is only a metaphor. When we're working in a film like The Empire Strikes Back, we know we're co-starring with real magic. I'm talking about special effects that blend of art and technology that enables rocket ships that have never been built to fly to planets that don't exist and encounter creatures that have never lived, except in someone's imagination. Now, it's that kind of magic we're going to explore in the next hour, the true magic of the movies, sleight of hand that fools the eye, frees the mind, and at its very best, lifts the spirit. It begins, as everything in movies does, with an attempt to solve a very basic problem, how to color in a screen that's as white and cold and empty as the ice planet of Hoth. The best way to fill in those blank spaces is through fantasy. And the country of fantasy has always been the breeding ground for mythical beasts, some of whom are friendly and helpful, like this Tauntaun who provided transportation for us on Hoth. The only trouble with mythical creatures is that they're 
mythical. You can't go out and rent one at a zoo. You have to create them. But in creating them, you also create problems. As you can see, my life-size Tauntaun can't move. It has sawhorses where her legs should be. On location in Norway, Irvin Kirshner, the director, had to shoot live action very carefully so it could be integrated with special effects material shot later. You all right? Uh, yeah, of course. Of course. To make my Tauntaun move, a miniature of her with a model of me aboard had to be created. That was then photographed one frame at a time through a process known as stop motion photography at our special effects studio near San Francisco. Okay. Shooting. It takes Dennis Murin and Phil okay. Tippett an hour just to make one second of stop motion film. The adjustments between frames of all the tiny moving parts are minuscule, but projected at the proper speed, 24 frames per second. These individual movements will flow seamlessly together. George Lucas, who conceived the Star Wars saga, was executive producer and final arbiter of special effects. The special effects supervisors were Brian Johnson and Richard Edlin, whose province was photography. They led a team of 90 craftsmen who worked 14 months and spent $7 million on Empire's special effects. George Lucas's very first film was a special effects picture. He was 10 years old when he and a friend went on location in his mother's kitchen to make a stop motion epic that looked something like this. From film's beginnings, monsters have been animated by stop motion. The brontosaurus rampaging through London in 1925's The Lost World was created by Willis O'Brien. Later, he made the original King Kong. The beast from 20,000 Fathoms wasn't much more than 20 inches tall in reality. He just looked bigger when another legendary effects master, Ray Harryhausen, combined him with live actors in this 1953 movie. orchestration of all known effects techniques. It was a model Kong that reached the top of a model Empire State Building, but it was a real Fay Ray caught in a giant mechanical hand. These are models. The planes are real. The close-ups of the pilots were shot on a stage. Here, both girl and ape are models. That's the real Fay Ray Kong just set down. Now we cut back to the pilots, which sets up a model plane's fatal confrontation with the model Kong. All these special effects techniques, young people who seem to have an affinity for monsters can and do master. As 14-year-old Steve Rochefort of Walnut Creek, California did. Mostly, kids make their monsters out of a material they've known since kindergarten. This fellow, who seems to be his own worst enemy, was made by fifth graders at the Alan Orca School in Seattle. Filmmaking is no longer a college-level subject. It's being taught in elementary and high schools all across the country. Violence trauma. You've got a problem, I'll tell you. Again. The reason I like monster movies is because it helps me escape from reality. We really are producing a new kind of film generation young people who are doers as well as watchers. The Intruder was made by Scott Morris of New York City when he was 17 years old.
The kid's interest in and knowledgeability about highly technical aspects of movie making certainly contributes to the current popularity of pictures featuring special effects. A 14-year-old girl, Laurel Hughes, made Snake in the Lake. Young people combine stop motion and live footage just as the professionals do. The monster's name is Grog. The film's name is Imagine. The filmmaker is Tom Davis of Edison, New Jersey. Some monsters move not through stop motion, but under their own power. These are small reptiles shot in close-up and composited with live actors. Makeup men worked on the little lizards so they looked more like their extinct cousins. Some monsters have to be fully mechanized, like these 12 feet tall ants in Them, which was produced in 1954. When they remade Kong in 1976, they built a full-scale ape. Like Fay Ray before her, Jessica Lange spent many uncomfortable weeks caught in Kong's mighty clutches. That huge arm, however, was not attached to the ape's body. It was mounted on a crane which supplied the power for lifting. The fingers were moved by a complicated hydraulic system. Mechanicals are great for showing scale not so good for subtleties of movement or emotions. Our snow monster, the Wampa, was actually an actor dressed in this costume. Steady! Hey, steady, girl! Hey, what's the matter? You smell something? This is a shot I wish they could have gotten one take. Or done with mirrors. Or something. Not that Dez Webb, who played the Wampa, had it easy. Dez is 7'4". He was trying to walk in snow on two and a half foot stilts. With his mask on, he was 11 feet tall. Most of the strange creatures that populate the Star Wars galaxies are created in Stuart Freeborn's workrooms in London. Stuart says that a lot of his best ideas come to him in dreams, after which they start turning up in other people's nightmares. Freeborn, Rick Baker and their associates created what is probably the most famous monster rally in the history of movies. The cantina sequence from Star Wars, where the flotsam and jetsam of an entire galaxy gathered in one bar room. If you're an actor, it's comforting to know that when a range of emotions is required, there's no substitute for a man behind a mask. When you look ahead, also look around. The stuff's still flying in the air. It's just a disintegrator. Wham! Chewbacca the Wookiee is played by a gentle giant of a man named Peter Mayhew. I think like a, well, not like a, like a Wookiee almost, but there are such, there's such a lot of um, feeling that can go in and can be expressed that it's just, oh, it's just a nice character to do. Despite his language barrier, <laughs> Chewie communicates his feelings perfectly. <laughs> Sir, all the patrols are in. Still no. Still no contact from Skywalker Solo. He can also register yes, deeper feelings. Hmm? Artu says the chances of survival are 725 to 1.
actually, R2 has been known to make mistakes. Well, Your Worship, looks like you managed to keep me around for a little while longer. I had nothing to do with it. I think you just can't bear to let a gorgeous guy like me out of your sight. I don't know where you get your delusions, laser brain. <laughs> Laugh it up, fuzzball. And he has a terrific sense of humor. Nice on long trips. For the climactic battle scene shot on location in Norway, we used a mountain rescue team as rebel soldiers. Now. Yeah. The attackers are coming from over there, and you're shooting at them. There's explosions going on all around you. OK? So go down the trench, and I'll come and give you something. Assistant Director Bill Wesley was not always certain he was getting through to his Norwegian troops. Make the bloody thing work, yeah? Bang! That sort of thing, OK? Good lad, it's you. This thing has got a bit of a kick to it, I would think. So it's gone. You know that? That type of thing, yeah? The Empire is coming from that direction, which are 40-foot giants. You can't see them unless we map them on. Here we go, then. Action! Explosion one. Explosion one, David. Two, if you can. Three. Explosion three. Four. The trouble with acting in a movie like Empire is that half the time you can't see your enemies, or for that matter, your friends. Even though the actors have been shown artist sketches and production paintings, we don't know exactly what the scene will look like until after the effects people have done their job, a year or more after the actors have finished shooting. When everything is pulled together and I see it projected in a theater for the first time, it can be pretty scary. A terrific performance can be meaningless if it can't be integrated with the effects. And likewise, the most spectacular effect in the world can be flattened if the actor's response to it is wrong. But when everything is properly orchestrated, it's like a miracle to me, even when I've been in on its creation. The 40-foot monsters the Norwegian extras were pretending to face are these snow walkers, added later through special effects. Laser rays were also added later, literally painted in by animators. Explosions were also enhanced by animation and sound effects. Some of those 40-foot snow walkers we were trying to imagine back in Norway were actually models which can be carried in the palm of your hand. They were filmed against background paintings and snowscapes months later. The models came in several sizes to match the scale of different live action shots. The artificial snow is made out of baking soda and microscopic glass bubbles. It took nine months to design and build these models. Dennis Murin does the stop-motion photography. The animator is John Bird. Once again, each articulated part of the model must be moved, no more than a fraction of an inch between each single frame exposure in these stop-motion sequences. The animators shot motion studies of animals in order to perfect the movements of their models. The snow walkers followed in this elephant's footsteps. Because the live action footage was finished before most of the special effects were completed, animated sketches, animatics, of the finished sequence were made. They served as moving blueprints for the film editor and the effects people. Orchestration, an artful blending of all the elements in a sequence, is everything in a film like Empire. The pilot's point of view, as they attacked the snow walkers, was shot on a specially developed camera. It's linked to a computer that remembers each move precisely so that it can be repeated as often as necessary. The television monitor allows the motion control camera operators to see precisely what the camera is seeing and make whatever adjustments are necessary in rehearsal. Oh, 
Vaughn, coming in. The speeder's flybys were done with models against a blue screen. The blue screen provides a neutral background so that still more elements can be added to the shot later. This speeder is one of the planes taking part in the snow battle. What the special effects people are doing under Richard Edlund's direction is arranging for it to be blown out of the sky. Okay, why don't we hit the blue screen? Okay, that's, oh, oh, oh. Okay, right there. Okay, back up to the next position. This model is specially constructed so that it can carry a small explosive charge and break apart when it's fired. All right, let her go. The explosion will be triggered electrically. Bang, bang. Yeah, right. that's it. Okay, should we load it? The explosive charge right. is a secret concoction formulated to explode spectacularly and burn colorfully. The shot will be made by a high-speed camera that will, in effect, extend the shot so that the small model will look like a full-scale plane under realistic attack. Set her down easy. Hmm? The special effects team has worked eight hours to create this shot. It will last just over one second on screen. Is there anybody not ready? Everything's armed, ready to go. Okay. Light the smoke. Okay, let her go. To make sure the shot is recorded, and to give the editor a choice of angles, it is covered by several cameras. This is how the shot was worked into the final sequence. Set for position three. Steady. Stay tight and low. Ow! Enormously important in creating the full dramatic impact of a special effect is the sound. Sound designer Ben Burt. In a fantasy film, we have an imaginary world. Uh, in, in a film such as Star Wars and now The Empire Strikes Back, we're dealing with imaginary environments, and imaginary vehicles, weapons, strange creatures, all sorts of electronic equipment or some sorts of odd equipment, things we've never, have never existed. So there, there are no real sounds that, that are recorded while the movie's being filmed. And all of the sounds have to be invented uh, and tailored especially for this kind of movie. Ben and his crew collected sounds in the strangest places. These taps on a radio tower's guy wire are part of the sound of a laser pistol being fired. The shearing machine, used to cut sheet metal, is part of the sound of a snow walker's footstep. A parking meter contributes to the cocking of a laser pistol. Here, Ben Bird is enhancing the whoosh of a laser sword as it cuts through the air. Music adds the final touch of dramatic emphasis. Composer John Williams conducts the London Symphony in his score for The Empire Strikes Back. All the sounds of the Empire, dialogue, music, effects, are recorded on these reels. It sometimes takes over 150 such units to produce one reel of finished film. Eight sound editors work six months to prepare for this dubbing session, or mix, where the sounds are blended and balanced. This is the last opportunity the filmmakers have to put a final polish on their work. But the results can be spectacular. Thief of Baghdad, 1924. 
When Douglas Fairbanks took to the air, he was realizing, thanks to special effects, a dream of freedom as old as our need to make up fairy tales. The remake of The Thief in 1940 is a landmark in special effects history. Effects supervisor Lawrence Butler found all kinds of ways to get his characters airborne. That's Sabu hitching a ride with Rex Ingram playing the giant genie. One of the picture's riders was Miles Mallison, the actor, who gave himself a nice scene as a caliph with a magical horse. People have been imagining them since the beginning of time, but it's only here at the movies that you can actually see a flying carpet fly, or a Pegasus gallop through the sky, or an English nanny get full value out of her umbrella. As for flying machines, well, movies were actually a commonplace in our lives before they were. Even today, most people experience flight at the movies before they experience it in reality. And thanks to special effects, we could get safely to the moon and back long before we could get reliably from here to Akron by air. The art of special effects has always been ahead of the technology of flight, predicting the shape of things to come. The first to do so, with charming Gallic wit, was George Melies in what was also the first great special effects film, Trip to the Moon, in 1902. A little later, Melies made a more modest journey to the North Pole, but his aircraft was as whimsical as ever. Intergalactic travel was a commonplace in the Flash Gordon serial of 1936. though they could have used a little help from the sound department. Things to Come, made that same year in England, offered more imaginative aircraft, H.G. Wells' accurate prophecies about World War II, and some inaccurate ones about the post-war years. One of the contemporary special effects masters, Albert Whitlock, won an Academy Award for his work with the Hindenburg in 1975. With models, blue screen, and paintings, he recreated the last voyage of the doomed airship. In 1979, Peter Ellenshaw visualized for us what it would be like to tumble into one of the great mysteries of space in Disney's The Black Hole. The modern era of special effects begins here, with Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. The year was 1968. The film challenged and inspired a new generation of special effects artists. Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind reversed the usual pattern of space adventures. In this 1977 film, we don't voyage to other worlds. Instead, voyagers from other worlds drop in on us. And unlike most of the previous movie visitors to our small planet, they turn out to be friendly. The effects in the conclusion were supervised by Douglas Trumbull. there was this now famous set of images from the opening sequence of Star Wars. That film seems to have permanently turned moviegoers' faces towards space, their minds towards space fantasy. Star Wars introduced us to what may be the most memorable and temperamental flying machine in movie history, the Millennium Falcon. It comes in several models, all of them cranky. One Falcon can't fly at all. It's a set permanently based in London. It was fashioned by English shipbuilders. It's 60 feet in diameter, 16 feet high, and weighs 40 tons. To its owner, Han Solo, it's sort of like a hot rod, something to tinker with. Nothing but trouble. All right, that's it. Try it. 
is never going to get us past that blockade. This has got a few surprises left in her sweetheart. What makes the Falcon lovable is that it generally works best when there's a crisis in Punch it! As machines go, the Falcon is quite a character. When it has to fly, or seem to, it's a model that's set in motion against a blue screen. The largest of them weighs close to 200 pounds and is four feet in diameter. There's another one two feet across. Very good for navigating an asteroid field. Yet another is just five inches in size. The smallest is only two inches. Which one to use in a shot is determined by the scale of other objects in the scene. To place a ship in motion in space, a model is shot against a blue screen. This shot is later combined with other elements also photographed against a blue screen, like this Star Destroyer. The Falcon being hit. And the actors in the cockpit of the Falcon. Then you take a star field and add each separate element over it. Some shots in Empire contain 38 elements. Let's get out of here. Ready for light speed? One, two, three! Let's look, it's our work. It's not my fault. No light speed. It's not my fault. The journey through the asteroids was the film's most complex blue screen sequence. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. The Falcon's cockpit was photographed against a blue screen. Each approaching asteroid also had to be shot separately against a blue screen and then combined. A blue screen's blue registers clear when printed on black and white film. From this film, two mats are created, one black on white, the other white on black. Superimposed on separate pieces of color film and printing, one mat generated by the blue screen prevents the foreground object from registering. The other does the same for the background. All the different elements created through blue screen photography must be perfectly aligned when the final composite color print is made. When all that work is done, a background and a foreground shot many months or miles apart can be joined undetectably. There are 604 blue screen shots in The Empire Strikes Back. You don't have to have a blue screen in the basement to travel in space. There is one in the corner. These junior high school students at the Rincon School in West Covina near Los Angeles are using models and stop motion to create their space fantasy. Jeffrey and Randy Holmes of Portland, Oregon were 17 and 15 when they made Escape from Incubus using models. If you don't want to make models, paper cutouts will do. That's what 11-year-olds Mitchell de Severn Jaquette and Kevin Moore used in Star Force 2. Sean Casey of Los Angeles was only 12 when he launched the mighty forces that do battle in Space War 300. His fleets of rocket ships were all cut out of paper. Amateurs can achieve very professional effects. 
This Star Wars look-alike was actually made by Mark Sullivan of Columbus, Ohio, when he was 18. It's called Night Speed. It's not fancy equipment that makes a special effects sequence memorable. The key factor is using what you've got imaginatively. A sense of humor helps, too, as filmmakers Ernie Facilius and Michael Weiss of San Francisco proved when they made this parody of Star Wars. It's called Hardware Wars. Han Solo's not the only one who has to go to a lot of trouble to make a rocket ship straighten up and fly right. But I must say, the results are well worth the effort. Working on a glacier during the worst march since the Norwegians started keeping records, you begin to have strange thoughts. Keep going. Straight ahead is towards the uh, branch. Straight ahead is always towards the branch. You begin to wonder, for example, if they've got any openings over in special effects. At least the work is indoors. Cut. Jedi Master who instructed me. Ben! Right about then, anywhere the temperature wasn't 30 degrees below zero sounded good to me. And I knew Dagobah was actually to be found on a nice, warm stage in London. Besides, anywhere you can learn more about the Force is fine with me. I suppose that more people ask me about that than anything else. And I don't like to be too specific when I answer. Everyone has his own ideas about it. And if none of them is exactly right, none of them is necessarily wrong. Ultimately, the Force is what you make of it. But if you really want to be with the Force, it's best to begin at the beginning with the man who will probably always personify it, Alec Guinness as Obi-Wan Ben Kenobi in Star Wars. Now, the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. Getting to Dagobah was easy. It was just a few blue screens away. I know, I know! All the scopes are dead. I can't see a thing. Just hang on. I'm going to start the landing cycle. Now, it wasn't the best landing Luke ever made. Actually, it was the effects people's doing. They mounted a high-speed camera on a cable and crashed it through the trees. The special effects shot perfectly matched the footage we had made on the extra-large soundstage that was built especially for Empire at the Elstree studio near London. Of course, a place like Dagobah can be difficult, especially for a little droid who isn't always as smart as he thinks he is. No, RT, you stay put. I'll have a look around. R2? R2! Where are you? R2! You be more careful. R2. That way.
there's a certain irony about the fact that that huge stage was a setting for the tiniest character in the film. That all those people were basically on hand to serve one little gnome of a fellow. But as usual, Yoda had something to say, even on that point. Size matters not. Look at me. Just me by my size, do you? Hmm? Hmm. And where you should not. For my ally is the Force. And a powerful ally it is. For a recluse, Yoda has a surprising capacity to attract a crowd. That's partly a tribute to the force of his personality, partly a tribute to the force of his ideas about the force, and partly a tribute to the powerful hold that the art of the puppeteer has on almost everyone. The Yoda you see in these behind the scenes shots is not the one we used in the film. Just like a real actor, Yoda has a stand in. Yoda was created by Stuart Freeborn. He says he modeled the eyes on those of Albert Einstein. Capable of an almost infinite range of expressions, Yoda may be the most complicated puppet ever built. Yoda is controlled by Frank Oz of the Muppets, who also supplied his voice. Feel the force around you. Here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land, and the ship. Movie makers aren't as adept with the force as Yoda. When he seems to lift my X-Wing out of the swamp, we actually had to use a crane. The move was completed with a blue screen shot of a model made in San Francisco. For the climactic scene, Luke's confrontation with the dark side of the Force, I had to study kendo and karate. Under the direction of stunt coordinator Peter Diamond, fencing master Bob Anderson helped me put the finishing touches on my technique for the carefully choreographed battle with the laser swords. The laser swords are a special effect. Their glow is enhanced by a process called rotoscoping. Eight, nine, J, take nine. Some special effects aren't so terribly special. At one point in the duel with Darth Vader, he unleashes the dark side of the force against Luke. In reality, it was just stagehands standing out of camera range, throwing things at me. purposes, it was a stunt double, Colin Skeeping, who stood in for me when the dark side carried Luke out the window. As for the next shot, where Luke's hanging onto a ledge for dear life, I did that against blue screen. The reactor shaft background that was later tricked in behind me was painted on glass and photographed by Harrison Ellenshaw, the head of our mat department. Yeah, let's do it Harrison time. learned his art from his father, Peter, Same who supervised the mats we've seen from Mary Poppins in the Black Hole. This is how the final composite looked.
The art of special effects is infinite, perhaps as infinite as the never-ending duel between good and evil. Special effects are the purest form of movie making. With them, we can create visions that owe nothing to any other form of artistic expression and which no other art can possibly duplicate. We now possess a technology that places anything man can imagine within reach of the camera. There's no place, past, present, or future, it cannot go. But if we possess this new technology, we mustn't allow it to possess us, as so many of the century's great inventions have come to do. For in the end, special effect is just a special effect. If it isn't surrounded by people we care about, if it doesn't serve a story that moves and involves us, and if, above all, it, it doesn't help us to grasp some larger imaginative vision, then it's just a trick, a, a gimmick. A... All right, R2, all right. I know I get carried away sometimes. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, as an old friend of mine once told me. Hmm. Adventure, ah, excitement. A Jedi craves not these things. Ah, but we do. Just as we crave beauty and flights that take us to worlds we've never seen, realms we've never experienced, the Star Wars saga will continue. In the largest sense, it can never end because imagination has no end.